Okay, <clears throat> we're going to follow up with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, journey that we started last week. Um, let me get the laser printer out here. And uh, <clears throat> I, I'm sorry, it was two weeks ago actually that we started, and. Uh, and yet, it's in, I wanted to speak mainly about the epistles, and there certain, seems to be a certain order in the epistles um, that has been very helpful to us, and uh, you often find references to it in the ministry of the brethren, although um, it uh, uh, hasn't really been outlined so much as we're trying to do here. But we talked about the four stages of our Christian journey, and we look to... Uh, uh, the tabernacle, and also the uh, Egypt to Canaan uh, to uh, identify an order for those epistles. Uh, we looked at the four major steps of uh, salvation. We spoke about that two weeks ago and sanctification, which corresponds to the wilderness, as we'll see in just a moment. Today, we want to emphasize the last two, uh, satisfaction uh, or the sanctuary, and then the remnant testimony and prophetic intelligence, the fourth stage of our Christian journey. So this was a slide from last time. Um, I do have a couple spreadsheets if somebody's interested in those, because we're going to go over those fairly quickly. But I'd be happy to email those to anybody who's interested in studying those in a little more detail. Uh, we also talked about uh, last week again, a couple weeks ago. Uh, about the New Testament outline that seems to correspond with this pattern or journey. Uh, first of all, of course, is the gospel of the grace of God in Acts chapter 20. Uh, that's where our Christian journey begins. It goes to the kingdom of God or the moral side, that which corresponds with the wilderness journey. We'll speak about that a little bit more. And today we're going to emphasize all the counsel of God. Uh, the sanctuary, again, is identified in the tabernacle. And then we're going to look at the fourth stage, the present truth, uh, the stage in which we live today, a remnant testimony. We'll be speaking about that somewhat. Okay, we talked about this last time again. Um, <clears throat> the uh, journey from Egypt to Canaan helps us understand this journey. Uh, again, we looked at the uh, salvation last time, it was going from uh, uh, Egypt and being delivered from Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. Also, the Passover was so critical at that time. And then we spoke about the four stages in the wilderness. We'll look at that very briefly again, just to, just to refresh our minds. Today, what we want to emphasize again is the satisfaction that comes from Canaan. And then finally, the uh, remnant testimony, uh, which we also have uh, as part of the present truth, the, uh, the uh, portion of the uh, dispensation in which we live today. Spoke about the tabernacle too. These two great types in the Old Testament give us a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, an understanding of the pattern we're going to follow. I don't believe it's an absolute pattern, but nonetheless, it's a general pattern. Uh, the different epistles uh, are all unified in themselves. They're like beautiful gems in themselves, but they can also be put into a certain order, um, in a general way at least. Sometimes you'll find an order uh, uh, an epistle in one place and sometimes in another place as well. And we'll look at that today. But we did speak about this last week briefly. We spoke about the uh, gate, as it's called in scripture, how you have to push your way into it. The kingdom of God is taken, is, uh, taken by force. It takes spiritual energy to enter in. And then we spoke about the brazen altar, which speaks of the work of Christ on the cross. Uh, the very foundation of our Christian blessings and journey. And then sanctification, the uh, brazen uh, labor, 
which corresponds to the wilderness. We don't get a lot of detail on that in uh, the tabernacle, but we get more detail on the journey through the wilderness, especially in parts of Exodus and then in Numbers. Now today we're going to speak particularly about that which has to do with the sanctuary itself. All right, here's where we were last week. Uh, the first two stages, we talked about Romans, the first eight chapters, and uh, how that brings us into the wilderness. James is a transitional book. Spoke about First and Second Thessalonians, where they were exhorted to walk worthy of God. And we have much individual truth there. Those are brand new Christians. And those were the teachings that they received from the Apostle Paul, the first epistles that he wrote. First and Second Peter correspond more with the government of God and the uh, responsibility we have to walk as believers. It includes that which is precious, but also that which is suffering. One of his main themes is the kingdom, the present aspect of the kingdom in First Peter and the future aspect of the kingdom in Second Peter, as we spoke last time. Also, we have corrective epistles. The two main corrective epistles are 1 Corinthians and Galatians, where the believers had, had uh, gone backwards, had regressed, and the Apostle Paul had to correct them. And uh, we read about living by faith in Galatians, the emphasis being on faith, not the law. Whereas in Romans, the emphasis was on the just how to be justified before God, a brand new standing before God. And we spoke about preparation. Second Corinthians is restorative. Philippians is joy. It speaks of walking worthy of the gospel. It's proper Christian experience. And in Hebrews, we have uh, a great epistle of sanctification. Again, that quotation from uh, the Old Testament, Haggai, the just shall live by faith, how we're to live. The Christian life. Okay, here's the tabernacle. We're going to look at the progression a little bit more. There is a progression of the epistles. We'll look at that in the next slide. But remember last week I spoke a lot of the diagrams I found on the internet seem to show an open gate. I don't think that's quite correct as we mentioned last week. We have to press our way into the kingdom of God. It takes spiritual energy and the grace of God for us to enter in. So I believe that really should be closed. And yet at the same time, uh, there's a great beauty there, promise of great blessing. The four colors we spoke about in the uh, gate, the white background, which speaks of purity, the blue, which speaks of that which is heavenly, the purple, which is, speaks about that which is universal blessing, and then the scarlet, which speaks of suffering, but also speaks of the promises God has made to Israel. And then, of course, the brazen altar. Again, we spoke about that, the brazen labor. Now we're going to speak particularly about that which takes place in the sanctuary itself. There is a door, Scripture calls it, at least in the King James Version of the English Bible. It calls this a door. It calls this the gate here. It calls this the door. It's a door to special Christian blessings, what we call the mystery. Paul had two main ministries, as we read in various places, including Romans and also in Colossians chapter 1. One main uh, ministry had to do with the gospel, the very foundation of our Christian blessings. The second ministry has to do with what he calls the mystery those specialized blessings for Christianity. This is called the gospel of the grace of God, how far down God has reached to pick us up and to save us. But that's not the end of Christianity. Uh, rather, we're brought into great blessings as well. And what we have in the sanctuary is what's called the gospel of the glory of God. And we're going to speak of that. There's three main pieces of furniture in this room here. The candlestick, the table of showbread, and the golden altar. And then in the holiest of all, of course, is the ark, the very throne of God. 
The Jews had to pass through a veil to get to the holiest of all. For Christianity, of course, we know at the Lord's death, the veil was rent from top to bottom. And so for the Christian, it's all one room. The conflict with spiritual powers, uh, evil spiritual powers, is in a sense in this room. They do not enter into the immediate presence of God, the holiest of all. But we do. As Christians, that's where our worship is. Well, let's look at the progression of the epistles. This is mainly what we wanted to speak about. It's a lot of details, of course, we can't get into at this point. But thankfully, I think in these meetings, I've seen that there's quite a number of brothers that have addressed uh, some of these uh, uh, subjects in more detail. And uh, uh, that's very helpful. And if somebody wants to brush up on that, they certainly can. But what I want to show mainly is that there's a progression by and large, in these epistles that's been very helpful to understand for me, at least, and for others, too, in this area. First of all, we spoke last week of the progression we have in the Song of Solomon. When we're first saved, we're so thankful that our beloved is mine, and we belong to him. The next stage, as we begin to mature in our Christian journey, what corresponds to the uh, uh, well, to the wilderness, is that these notice these are switched around. First, he recognizes that we belong to the Lord first of all, and then that He belongs to us. Uh, I've often thought of it. We'll look at the third stage as well. We went over last week, but uh, I've often thought of it as somebody standing in front of the sun. And I, we begin our journey, in a sense, we have our back to the sun, and we're mostly occupied with what we've gained by salvation, the great needs that have been met. And that's certainly appropriate when we're first saved. But as we begin to mature, as a person begins to turn towards the sun, he sees now the sun, and he sees his claims on us, that uh, we belong to him. And then he belongs to us as well. But then finally, if we turn face full to the sun, we get uh, beyond ourselves, so to speak, and we become formed by the object we have. And so the third stage, you can see in the uh, seventh chapter of Song of Solomon, as we went through the wilderness, is I am my beloved's, the fact we belong to him. And his desire is towards me. It's as if the believer is facing full face to the sun now and uh, loses sight of himself because his object is Christ. And what his desire is towards us, that's a mark of Christian maturity in our Christian journey. Okay, the Christian motto, as we have it, is in Galatians, is not I but Christ. Okay, today now, <clears throat> we're going to enter into the uh, next section. Um, I will quoted this from William McDonald last week. Uh, it impressed me when I read it. He was referring, of course, to the 10 lepers in uh, Luke 17 that uh, were healed. Only one of those lepers returned to thank the Lord Jesus and worship at his feet. And Mr. McDonald makes the uh, correlation that um, only the grateful 10% inherit Christ's true riches. Sad to say, many Christians never enter into our real blessings, which are belong to every believer. And we're going to speak about that. This corresponds with the door of the sanctuary. It's interesting. Part of the reason I made the color here kind of a bronze color the, in the outer area of the tabernacle is because the labor and the, and the great altar were both made of brass. That speaks of God meeting the needs of the sinner where he is. It, it, needs, it meets the question of sin. But as we enter into the sanctuary, it's a little different. Everything is gold there. Everything that you can see is gold. <clears throat> the only exception to that is the sockets underneath the boards of wood. 
covered with gold. That speaks of redemption. The basis on which we are there, we'll speak about that a little further. But the great secret of what's in the sanctuary is that we are interested in the glory of Christ, as well as our identification with him in it. <clears throat> Here we have a quotation from Colossians 1. Father hath translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. It's a whole new world we're brought into, of which Christ is the head and the center. This is the basis of our real Christian blessings. Christ is everything, is the better translation in Colossians 3.11. This is the world where Christ is everything. And this world in which we were born, uh, we were under the thraldom of Satan. And this world system of which Satan uh, is the, he's called the prince, and he's called the, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 what's the other one? The prince and the power of the air. Um, he's looked at as the head of the political system and also uh, as the god of this present world. Um, uh, he looks at as the head of the religious system. But as we enter into the sanctuary, we find that Christ is everything. It's a whole different world. This is the world uh, in which is our proper Christian uh, occupation and employment. And this is where we get enter into our real blessings. It's often called the mystery of God. Uh, because it was hid uh, in, in God in the past times. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. Now we have types that help us understand it, now that we have the New Testament. But notice what it says in Colossians 2. This is, again, again the proper translation. The mystery of God, in which are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. These are the things we want to speak about very briefly today, and others speak about it in much more detail. Okay, so this is the third stage of our Christian journey, satisfaction. And uh, referencing, re referencing, again, Colossians chapter, uh, Acts chapter 20, it's all the counsel of God are also called in 1 Timothy 1, called the gospel of the glory of God. The gospel of the grace of God is how far down God has reached to bless us. But the gospel of the glory of God is the position to which God has raised us in association with his beloved son. There's a quotation I appreciate from Hamilton Smith. The saving grace of God meets our condition as sinners. That's the brass, the brazen altar, and the brazen labor. But the counsels of God reveal what he has purchased to bring to pass for the satisfaction of his own heart. That's the sanctuary. The tabernacle again, the sanctuary itself, the mystery of Christ and the church revealed to consecrated believers. We see that the door of the, of the uh, sanctuary uh, corresponds with the with consecration. Uh, that's how we enter into those blessings. When we uh, lose sight of ourselves and we are occupied with Christ, who he is, and the blessings that he uh, has bestowed uh, upon his people. It's the treasure room of the eternal God. Remember, uh, those different pieces of furniture. We're going to speak about those in more detail, what they explain or what they illustrate, perhaps I should say, and some of the epistles that correspond to that. And it's also the throne room. That's the Holy of Holies of the eternal God. Remember Esther, when she, uh, though she was queen of the whole realm of Persia, yet she trembled when she thought of entering into the throne room of Ahasuerus, the king. She knew that unless he extended the scepter to her, she would die. And so when we enter into the sanctuary, 
it's important that we enter in with unshod feet and our heads uncovered and realize that this, these are the deepest mysteries of the eternity, eternity that God has brought us into. So the crossing of the Jordan and the entrance into Canaan are pictured by Jordan. Uh, that's a picture of consecration. Consecration literally means to fill the hand or fill both hands. I believe it's a picture of having our hands filled with Christ. That's when we're interested in his person, his work, his word, the purposes of God, that's consecration. And that opens the door. It still takes some energy. That's what consecration's about. It's not an open door per se. It's a door that requires that we push our way in as well. But it's the place of spiritual blessings. And in one sense, the place of our current conflict, because all the powers of Satan are marshaled against our enjoying these spiritual blessings and identification with our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, <clears throat> I hope people can see that. Uh, it's a little... It's a chart I put together. I realize there's a lot of detail to this, but what it says is some samples of Christ's glories. Uh, perhaps that's obscured a little bit by the top there. Not sure how to get rid of that. But here's, I, I know this is a detailed chart. I'd be happy to send it to anybody who's interested in studying it in more detail. I don't pretend that it's original. I, I tried to derive it from a number of sources. Obviously, we don't have time to go into any detail here on it. Uh, this would take um, uh, one meeting or multiple meetings. But nonetheless, here's some samples of the Lord's glories. These are the things we learn about in the sanctuary. Let's just look at a few, a brief outline of these. Some of the Lord's glories are personal. He's divine. He's a son, eternal son. He's the creator. He has a personal, he also took manhood into his person. He's a true man, sin of heart. And uh, <clears throat> he's the heir. Uh, there's the moral glory we read about, his redemption glory, his headship glory. We'll speak about some of these in a little bit more detail. And there's what's called his pastoral glory as the shepherd, high priest, advocate, and then, of course, his kingdom or official glory when he's going to take the title deed of the earth uh, at the end of the tribulation and introduce the millennial period. Some of these are intrinsic. That is, they were his from a past eternity. But some have been acquired. He created the universe in time. He became a man in time. Uh, he became head of the church. In time, he was the head of creation, but he was the head of uh, all creation previously, but uh, he became the head of the church as well. Uh, not, uh, uh, well, he, he exhibited his moral glories when he was a man in this world, and uh, redemption, of course, are acquired and so on. Some are shared. Some are not shared. His divine person, of course, we will never become divine. We are partakers of the divine life, but we are not, never will be divine per se. But some are shared. Uh, he's a man. He wears our nature on the throne, we sometimes sing. Uh, we're going to share his heirship. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ and so on. So some are shared, some are not shared. He's the head of new creation, and so on. He's the bridegroom. We are the bride, but he is the bridegroom, and so on. Some are veiled. Some are not veiled. Uh, creation, of course, was not veiled. Some are veiled except to faith. And so these are some ways that others have uh, uh, identified these. And I found it a help. I know there's many, many scriptures here. Uh, when you have time, it's certainly worthwhile to go into that a little bit more. But we won't do that now. That's not our object. Okay, 
Let's look first at the approach and the crossing of Jordan. These are the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, as we mentioned. It's interesting, in Romans 9 through 11, we have dispensational distinctions. What do we mean by that? Dispensational, we simply mean if there's a distinction between the uh, origin, the calling, and the hopes of Israel, and the origin, and the call, and the hopes of the church. That's mainly what we're speaking about. There is a clear distinction, and we even have clues in the Old Testament that there would be this distant, uh, this dispensational distinction at the future time. I find it interesting in the last two chapters of Numbers, which is the end of the wilderness journey, that we have the cities of refuge brought up, and also we have the daughters of Zelophehad. And not to go into detail on that, but the cities of refuge speak of a man who was a manslayer, not a murderer, he could flee to the city of refuge and he was safe there, but only for as long as he stayed there and as long as the high priest, the current high priest, uh, was in power, in administrative power. As soon as the high priest passed away, which speaks of a new dispensation, he was free again and re could return to his own village. That's a picture of Israel. The Lord Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That commuted their sentence from murder to manslaughter. And Israel, in a certain sense, is in the city of refuge. Uh, someday, when this, this current dispensation is over, then they'll be released again because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now that's Numbers 35. In Numbers 36, we have the daughters of Zelophehad. They were daughters that uh, their father had passed away. They were daughters in the, in the uh, tribe of uh, Manasseh, and they had no brothers. There were five daughters. They valued the inheritance in Canaan. And so they came to Moses and they said, we want that inheritance. And so Moses went to the Lord and he said, you're right, you should have that inheritance. But then in chapter 36, the elders of Manasseh said, you know, there's a problem with that. The daughters of Zelophehad uh, uh, have a right to an inheritance. We're glad that they have a desire to have that. But if they marry somebody outside of this tribe of Manasseh, then that inheritance is going to be lost to the tribe of Manasseh, and uh, we don't want that to happen. So they uh, took it to the Lord, and the Lord said, the original inheritance is absolute. They must marry within their own tribe, and then the inheritance will not be lost to that tribe. Well, that's also a dispensational picture. Israel's inheritance is not lost. It's merely suspended for a time just like the city of refuge. Their inheritance was suspended for a time, but not lost. And so I think we have an interesting picture of that. Romans 9, 10, and 11 speaks to the dispensational distinction, and we can understand why. We might say, well, Romans was mostly written to Gentiles. That's true, it was. But uh, we have, uh, the question might have come up, in their mind of these Gentiles, they might say, well, Christianity and the gospel is wonderful, but it seems like perhaps we're displacing Israel. And if God is not faithful to his promises to Israel, how can we be sure that he will be faithful to his promises to us? So the Apostle Paul shows that uh, indeed, in God's sovereignty, he chose Israel chapter 9 and chapter 10, Israel uh, failed, but they really are in the position that presently of the manslayer in the cities of refuge. But God in chapter 11, God's purposes are irresistible. His purposes of blessing are irresistible, and Israel's future is secure. Once this present parenthesis, church parenthesis, is over, Israel will come back into their promised blessings. 
And so the Romans could be assured and we can be assured that God's word is sure. God's promises are absolute. His purposes of blessing are irresistible and we can trust God in all that he says. Okay, the key now to understanding all the counsel of God is consecration as we have in Romans 12, the early verses. And this is a quotation we're all familiar with. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or intelligent service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the key to the door to the sanctuary, again, is consecration. And that brings about a transformation. That word transformation is interesting. I don't know Greek at all, but I can read what others have said. The word is apparently is metamorpho. Metamorpho. When I, uh, when I was teaching, I taught at uh, junior college for about 10 years. When I was teaching, I'd often speak about metamorphosis, which is the transformation of the different stages of an insect. And the metamorphosis of some insects is, is, is incredible. Uh, they go from perhaps a, uh, a, an egg to, uh, uh, to a, uh, the various stages. Um, perhaps it looks like a, a worm. And then they may be transformed into a beautiful butterfly. We call that metamorphosis. It's a complete transformation, not only outward, but even biochemically. And that's what Christianity is. We're to be completely transformed from what we were to what God has made us and brought us into the good of. Okay, crossing the Jordan and entering into the Canaan. Uh, we go back to the... Uh, Back to the tabernacle, we have that golden candlestick within the sanctuary. That speaks of the apostles' doctrine. I'm referring, of course, to Acts 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. Well, the golden candlestick, no doubt, speaks of that, uh, that, uh, just a sec here. Oh, wow. Sorry about that. Okay. The Apostles' Doctrine, it's the mystery expounded. Uh, the golden candlestick speaks of the expounding of the mystery of God, or what's called the mystery of Christ in the church as well. Mainly in Colossians and Ephesians, we have this mystery expanded, expounded. In Colossians, we have circumcision, which is, corresponds really with consecration. Baptism is what characterizes salvation. It's the standing we're brought into. Circumcision is much more the state that, con that conforms with our standing. When we get our eyes off ourself and we enter into the world of which Christ is everything, we have our hands full of Christ. That's the sanctuary door, as we mentioned. It's the work and the glories of the risen Christ. We're to walk worthy of the Lord. Um, we're uh, meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light. These are the spiritual blessings that we have at the present time in Christ. And someday we're going to enjoy those as well. So Christ in you, we have in chapter 127. Uh, it's the... The truth, not that Christ lives in us, but it's the life of Christ that we have and we're to walk uh, in a Christ-like way. The hope of glory, I take it is that someday we're going to be with the Lord and enjoy these things without hindrance. The mystery of God in which are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We looked at that before. That's the proper quotation from chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Okay, also in Ephesians, these are the two main epistles that give us the, uh, the mystery, expound the mystery. Uh, in Ephesians, we're in Christ. It's not so much Christ in you, but it's 
in Christ. One of the commentators says that in Ephesians, we have the stillness and hush of the sanctuary. It's the mystery of his will that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, and whom also we have obtained an inheritance. There's really two different inheritances here. Uh, there's the inheritance that's spoken of in Colossians. That's a spiritual inheritance, which we have right now, the blessings of Christianity. There's also a material inheritance we're going to share with the Lord, of which this verse speaks in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. When the Lord Jesus is going to reign over the universe, both heaven and earth, we're going to reign there as his bride with him. Some of the details as far as our spiritual inheritance goes, especially, is that the church is the bride of Christ. We get that in Ephesians. It's actually called the great mystery. There are 10 mysteries in uh, the New Testament. Uh, the greatest of those and the only one that's called the great mystery is the mystery of Christ in the church. The fact that we are the house of God, God's house. The spirit of God dwells in believers individually and collectively. And so he is the one who is to be in charge in the assembly. And he is the one that we must reverence and we have to be careful how we walk. Just like in the old days of Israel, they had in the wilderness, they had that cloud and the pillar of fire over the tabernacle that signified that the Lord was in their midst and therefore they must be holy because God is holy. So it is with God's house. And then we are members of Christ's body. Something certainly was never said of any other of the families of faith. And uh, tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, walk worthy of the vocation or the calling. This is part of the calling. Christ is the bride. Christ's bride, church is the bride, house and body, wherewith ye are called. I like this word in chapter 2, verse 10. I think it's actually one of the uh, one of the keys to the book of Ephesians. It's translated uh, workmanship in our translation, but some of the commentators have pointed out, again, I don't know Greek at all, but I can read what others say. The word in chapter 210 of Ephesians is poema, sometimes translated masterpiece, where it says that we are God's masterpiece, or poema. From that word comes the English word poem. And so the believers, because of our blessings we've been brought into, are looked at as the poem, the highest of God's blessings for all of his creatures. And so we have that in chapter 2.10. I think it's really a key word for all of the book of Ephesians, poema. Okay, the mystery practiced. We had the mystery expounded. Now the mystery practice, the table of showbread now in uh, the tabernacle again. And if we refer back to Acts 2.42, perhaps we can say that's the apostles fellowship. We break bread at table. And so we have privileges uh, of fellowship uh, as part of our uh, spiritual blessings. As the bride, we are to be prepared for his presence at the present time. Are we preparing for his presence? Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5.25, the more we're occupied and taken up with his love for the church, the more we can be, uh, the more it will thrill our hearts. And uh, we can be so thankful that he loved us and gave himself for us. And that encourages us as the bride to live in such a way that we'll be prepared for his presence, which we will soon enter into at the rapture. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. That's the work of the Lord Jesus at present, is to present us 
is a chaste virgin uh, suitable to being the bride of Christ about to enter into his presence and to become his uh, bride for all eternity. And it tells us that in Revelation 19, we have the, the marriage of the Lamb. His wife has made herself ready, and she's clothed with the righteousnesses of saints. Those are the actual good works of the saints. It's not imputed righteousness, but it's actually those things that the saints did as saints of God to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. That's her bridal robe, and that's the day we look forward to as the bride. We're also a part of the house of God. The house of God speaks of holiness and order. And we have several epistles here now. This is Canaan uh, territory, I believe, as well. Philemon is sometimes called the polite epistle because we have the demonstration of Christ in you. Again, it's not that literally the Lord lives in us, but we have the life of Christ and we're to demonstrate that to the world. And that's exactly what we see. And Philemon, the Apostle Paul laying himself out for this escaped slave who had become a believer. And uh, he appeals to Philemon, another believer, uh, in a beautiful way. And so sometimes called the polite epistle, a demonstration of the life of Christ in each of these three people. Onesimus, the slave, Philemon, the former slaveholder and the Apostle Paul, the mediator between the two. And First Timothy, we have godly order in the assembly. Thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. What's that mean? It means that the truth of Scripture is deposited in the assembly. That's the ground of the truth. The assembly is to maintain the truth. The pillar is really more of the thought of a monument, that which uh, speaks as a testimony to the world of the truth that's in, been entrusted to us. Then Titus is similar to 1 Timothy in some ways, but the grand theme of Titus is soundness in faith demands purity in life. And even 1 Corinthians, although it's mainly a corrective epistle, we have the truth of the order of the house of God brought out in the first nine and a half chapters of First Corinthians. Okay, the mystery practiced. What about the golden altar? Again, in Acts 2.42, we have the breaking of bread and prayers. The house is also the place of priestly exercise and worship. First Peter 2 says that we are royal and holy priests. Hebrews says that we have, as priests now, we have boldness to enter into the holiest. That's the place where Israel never had the privilege of entering in, except the high priest only once a year, and that with not, not without blood. But the veil is rent now. The blood of Christ has answered the demands of God. And as priests, we have the privilege to enter in to the very presence of God, the throne room of God, we're invited to be there. But again, as I mentioned before, it must be with unshod feet, uncovered head. Uh, could also have mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, we're spoken of as kings and priests. What a beautiful privilege we've been brought into in the house of God. Well, we are the priestly family. We get that, I think, in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, sometimes called the epistles of the Lord's bosom. That is, it has to do with communion with the Father and the Son. In John's gospel, uh, life, light, and love is perfectly set forth in the Son. It's revealed and manifested in the perfect life of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the epistles, the fruits and proof of this life are set forth in the family, the priestly family. The mystery practice now, number three, the one body. I believe the tabernacle boards, there's a little difference of opinion on this, but 
I believe that the tabernacle boards that make up the uh, outward structure of the sanctuary, in a sense, are a little picture of the one body. Because the boards were made out of wood, they were covered with gold. Um, they were in sockets of silver, which speaks of redemption. The only right we have to be in the sanctuary is on the basis of the work of Christ, redemption. Uh, then they have a bar that passes through all of the boards. Uh, that's often spoken of as the Spirit of God, the unity of the Spirit. There is one body. The Spirit of God maintains that. That can never be broken. But the unity of the Spirit in practice is entrusted to the believers. We're to act practically on the truth that there is one body. And so there are also gifts that we have mentioned in Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, and in Romans that are given to men. And it's often been suggested that the bars on the outside of these, uh, of these uh, boards of the tabernacle perhaps point to the gifts that have been entrusted to the church. We have that, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 4. So I mentioned there 1 to 16, the apostles and prophets are the foundation, New Testament prophets. There's evangelists, there's shepherds, there's teachers. We can be thankful for each one of those. And uh, they're the ones that help maintain the one body, uh, I should say, the unity of the spirit, uh, which is the practical side of the truth that there's one body. Okay, finally, <clears throat> in the last uh, minutes we have, I want to speak about the fourth stage of our journey, which is a remnant testimony and also that we have prophetic intelligence. This is uh, an area that perhaps is least understood. Remember when we were quoting from Acts chapter 20, uh, he spoke about the time when uh, there would be failure in the general testimony, and there would be those who would come in among yourselves, wolves would rise up and seek to spoil the testimony. And so we know that every dispensation has passed through spiritual decline and failure. We have that mentioned in Judges. For instance, it cor correlates with Judges. After the book of Joshua, there was a spiritual decline, and we have that identified in the book of Judges. And then ultimately, there is apostasy, but there's also a remnant testimony, which we have identified in 1 Samuel. We'll speak to that a little bit more in detail. The decline of Christendom. Here's a chart from our brother Bruce Anstey. <clears throat> I tried to reproduce it because it didn't show up online, but um, there is a decline of Christendom that we're warned about in Scripture. The latter times began after the uh, uh, after the apostles, identified in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy, the last days, which refers to the, uh, the uh, last days of the Christian dispensation, when things would decline more and more and failure would come in. The last time is positive apostasy which we see in the book of Jude. We'll address that in just a moment. The last hour is identified in John's epistles, 1 John 2, verse 18, the very end of Christianity. Here's a uh, from our brother Bruce Anstey. Some others had mentioned Bruce Anstey, and I find his writings very helpful as well. And he mentioned this is his schematic. The simple schematic shows that as we approach the end, things will get steadily worse in the Christian testimony. He mentions 2 Timothy 3.13, and eventually it will close in God's judgment. Thus, the end of the Christian testimony is not restoration, but judgment. Again, compared to judges in the Old Testament, um, here's a summary of the end time epistles. Um, we are to be established in the present truth. It's not enough simply to be taken up with truth that we enjoy, uh, but it's also truth that we that would exercise us 
and uh, we are to be established in the present truth. What is God doing right now? Where are we in God's dispensational dealing? Are we furthering the dispensation of God as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1? Or are we going about to establish our own program? Well, this is a summary of the last epistles then, the end time epistles. Again, these are, we've mentioned some of these already, but again, uh, first and second Thessalonians, we have a distinction between the rapture, which is the end of the Christian dispensation, and the day of the Lord, which will take place after the tribulation. And uh, the day of the Lord begins when the Lord appears out of heaven in power and glory to judge this world in righteousness, take the title ED to the earth, and establish the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Second Timothy speaks of the house of God in disorder, the uh, fall of the testimony, and the establishment of a remnant principle. Uh, I believe when we speak about the remnant principle, we should distinguish between a moral remnant, which are overcomers at any period. In every period, there's always those who act accordingly to the light they have, but a positional remnant as well, which is separation after the ruin of the general testimony. We have that identified, for instance, in the church history in Revelation 2 and 3, beginning with Thyatira. The positional remnant begins then and continues to the end of the church period. We'll address this a little bit more in just about two minutes. Second Peter speaks of the kingdom of God and manifestation when the Lord Jesus comes out of heaven and he's going to judge uh, corrupt Christendom as well as the world as a whole. Jude speaks of apostasy, sometimes called the acts of the apostates, but it also speaks of the path of faith uh, in such a time. This is at the very end of the Christian dispensation. First, second, and third John give us the characteristics of eternal life in times of apostasy. There's always a path of faith for the godly until the Lord Jesus ends this dispensation. No one has a right to end the dispensation except God himself. That will happen at the rapture. Until that happens, the privileges of Christianity can be carried on in a remnant position. And then finally, in Revelation, we have the things which must shortly come to pass, judgment and blessing. This corresponds with Ruth and 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. Ruth is a picture of a moral remnant, one who was an overcomer and received the blessing as a result. And in 1 Samuel, we have a beautiful picture of that little remnant testimony uh, going to Shiloh. Shiloh was where the Lord had placed his name, but it was about to be removed. Uh, but we have the Hannahs and the Samuels and the Davids that are that little remnant testimony. And later on, we have the mighty men of David, those who were identified with David and his rejection, which is a picture of the present time, the remnant testimony. Why did those hold to David? Why did Hannah and these others uh, go on in the time of great weakness and failure? Because as we read in Hebrews 11, speaking of Moses specifically, he esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. Here's a quotation again describing this remnant testimony because it's often not understood very well. This is a quotation from our brother Bruce uh, Anstey again. The scriptures indicate that when wholesale failure comes in, a great principle which God falls back on is that he lets go of the public testimony as a whole, as he originally set it up, and works with a remnant. Well, I believe that happened with the uh, fall of the, the uh, ruin of the general testimony in the Catholic Church just prior to the Reformation. Where again, at the Reformation, we have the beginning of a remnant testimony. Then going on, when what he has committed into the hands of men and testimony fails, he reduces its size, strength, glory, and numbers 
and carries it on in a remnant testimony. And there he gives a quotation. The word remnant signifies the residue or that which remains of anything of what the original was set up for. God has acted on this principle in the history of Israel and now with the church and will do it again in a coming day with the Jews in the tribulation. And he gives a number of references for that. Okay, here's now a summary of the four stages of our Christian journey. Again, I'd be happy to send a copy of this chart to anybody if somebody would find it a help. But there we have the outline in Acts chapter 20. We have the tabernacle, which uh, corresponds with the first three stages. We have Egypt to Canaan, which emphasizes the first two stages particularly. And then in Canaan, uh, although the, the tabernacle goes into more detail in the sanctuary than what we have in Canaan. And we have uh, then finally Judges and 1 Samuel and the future material inheritance, which we're going to share with the Lord Jesus as we reign over heaven and earth in the millennial period. Here's a uh, outline and a progression of the New Testament epistles, as we mentioned. Um, we've walked through these, and uh, again, some are repeated. For instance, here's uh, first and second, third John, as I looked at that as a priestly family. But also, it speaks of the last hour in first, second, and third John. That which is a, that which abides, uh, even in times of uh, great distress or apostasy. And first Thessalonians speaks of the rapture. So some of these are repeated. But again, uh, it seems to me that the epistles, each one individually, is like a precious jewel. But those jewels can be strung together into a beautiful order, a beautiful necklace. And it seems that we have hints to that, both in the tabernacle and Egypt to Canaan. And this gives us an outline, I believe, of the four stages of our Christian journey. Okay, just to finish now, as our time is just about gone, our hour is gone. Beautiful hymn that we often sing, number 150 in the Little Flock, although it's been in many other hymn books as well. The sanctuary speaks of the glories of Christ, the new world into which we've been brought into. Thou art the everlasting word, the Father's only Son, God manifest, God seen and heard, the heaven's beloved one. Worthy, O Lamb of God, art thou that every knee to thee should bow. And thee most perfectly express, the Father's self thus shine. Fullness of Godhead to the blessed, eternally divine. Image of the infinite, unseen, whose being none can know. Brightness of light, no eye has seen. God's love revealed below. The higher mysteries of thy fame, the creature's grasp transcend. The Father only, thy blessed name of Son can comprehend. Yet loving thee, on whom is love ineffable, doth rest the worshippers, O Lord above, as one with thee are blessed. Of the vast universe of bliss, the center thou and Son. The eternal theme of praise is this, the heavens, beloved one. When we get that vision, it draws us out of this world in which we are living from day to day, transports us into the sanctuary of God and into the very holy of holies where we worship. Okay, our hour is up. Thank you very, uh, very much, Brother Eric. We can have a time of uh, discussion. Okay. There's there's my friend Dean. How are you doing, Dean? Good to see you as always. Greetings. I know we care. I know we we went over a lot of ground. Again, my my desire was not to go into detail on these things, but to catch the thread that goes through. And that's something that's often been overlooked. Like I say, it's one thing to see the the uh, beautiful gemstones. 
that each one of these uh, uh, each one of these epistles represents in itself. It's another thing to see their connection one with another and the flow there is from one to another. And I think again, we have the pattern given to us, especially in the tabernacle and in the uh, journey from Egypt to Canaan in the Old Testament. So that was my exercise, but I, I understand again, we went over a lot of things. Again, uh, I've been thankful that in these meetings that uh, Leonardo and Andrea and, and Grace have uh, have uh, 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 been uh, hosting that many of these subjects are gone into in detail. But my exercise was to try to bring the thread that coordinates the different ones and the flow of the different epistles. I've never really seen it anywhere else, although the literature often has references to one place or another, but I've never really seen it all coordinated together. So I hope that it's a help and I don't pretend that it's complete by any means. Eric, can you give us the uh, place where we can find those charts? Uh, uh, is it at your email address? Yeah, I can do that. Or I wonder, Andrea, uh, if I, uh, you can post them, can't you? Can I forward those to you? Or you posted them before. And then anybody can access them without having to email me. Yes, we can. We okay, so. uh, resend them to the WhatsApp group. Okay, so that's the best way to do it. Then everybody can get a copy. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eric. I enjoyed that. I I wondered if. Uh, you said something that I, I think I caught, but I'm not sure I caught it properly. <laughs> you mentioned, uh, uh, you made a comment about, I think you said 10, mis 10 mysteries mentioned in the, the New Testament. Is that what I heard? And yet uh, there's there's the one that's called the great mystery concerning Christ in the church. Would you, would you repeat that again? Yeah. Um... Bruce Anstey has written a pamphlet on that. You can find it in his little booklet on doctrinal definitions. Um, probably a better way to put it, John, is 10 groups of mysteries, because I think he groups all the uh, king, uh, all the uh, mysteries of the kingdom in Matthew 13 into one group. But it's interesting. I, I believe we have ages. We have dispensations. In the New Testament, we have mysteries. In the Old Testament, we have covenants. Notice, we don't have covenants in the New Testament, properly speaking. We don't have mysteries in the Old Testament. Mr. Grant, uh, F.W. Grant, made a comment about that that I've appreciated, that uh, he says you have covenants in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is characterized by covenants. The New Testament by mysteries. So uh, uh, that's, that's certainly a subject that perhaps we haven't followed as well. But Bruce has a good chart on that and an explanation of the 10 groups of mysteries there, uh, you might check that out. That's the easiest way to do that. Yeah, thank you. Maybe you can give us a meeting on it sometime. I think, Dean, you did, didn't you? Yeah, several on, yes, the covenants of dispensations. A while back. Then we have the recordings available of those meetings where they're being gave to us. Yeah, the the it's only the mystery of Christ in the church that's called the great mystery. That's of course in Ephesians chapter five, because that's the crown jewel of the mysteries of God. We we have to recognize that Christianity is the highest privileges afforded to all of God's creatures. There's many families in God's, uh, many families that will be in the millennium, uh, but Christianity has the highest blessings of all. That's a, a staggering thought.
Brother, could you expand on what consecration means and how it works? It's something that we do ourselves entirely. How do I, how do we consecrate ourselves? Yeah, that's a good question, Leonardo, and a very important question. Remember, in the Old Testament, um, the priests were consecrated, and that means they were uh, they had both their hands full, and uh, that's a picture of we having both our hands full of Christ. In other words, again, so much when we're first Christians, we're often occupied with our needs. We're so thankful for salvation, and that's appropriate. But as we grow in Christianity, uh, the object is to uh, get off of ourselves. I don't say we never get out of the wilderness. We don't. We always have needs. But the main occupation of our life is to be with Christ and his glories. And uh, consecration is the key to that. That's that door that gives the entrance to the sanctuary. And that's the crossing of the Jordan River into the blessings of Canaan. And it's to have both hands full of Christ. Uh, it's what we have there in Romans chapter 12, uh, that we're to offer up ourselves as living sacrifices, no longer to uh, simply live in this world and having, having Christianity as uh, something that helps us through the world. That's true in a certain sense. But... Our proper sphere now of blessing is in the heavenlies. We belong to Christ. And how do we how do we enjoy that? Well, by having both hands full of Christ. And what does that entail? Well, it begins with our what we sometimes call the Christian habits, reading and prayer, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, meetings like this. It occupies us with those things that are our spiritual heritage in the heavenlies. That's, I think, what consecration is. But I'd like to hear others on that. Um, but it's to have both hands full of Christ. And how can we do that? I like to think of uh, a person with both hands full. If uh, the world steps up to them and offers them some tremendous advantage, they will say, I'm sorry, I don't have any place to take a hold of that. I have my hands full. And so it's rejected because you already got your hands full. That's consecration. I enjoy that very much. Yeah, the Apostle Paul, uh, it's not a loss. It's a loss as far as earthly things go, but the Apostle Paul compared the loss of earthly things to dung in Philippians chapter 3, didn't he? And he said that the things he won by consecration were the uh, uh, was the only thing worth living for. The things that the world could offer are dung in comparison to that. And that's... Uh, normal Christian experience, isn't it? In uh, Exodus 32, where idolatry had come into the camp, um, verse 27 of Exodus 32, it says, Moses said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, put every man his sword upon his hip and go and return from gate to gate through the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. And Moses said, consecrate yourselves to the Lord. Let's see, consecrate today, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Yea, every man with his son and with his brother, and bring on yourselves a blessing today. Well, that was a, a moment when there was a, a clear and decided decision to be on the Lord's side 
whatever the cost was. And that would have been very difficult, naturally speaking, if your if your brother or your friend had, had been taken up with that idolatry. But it, the Lord um, was supreme above that all those natural ties. And um, so they were willing to take action for the Lord, but it's nice. It says, and bring on yourselves a blessing. And it was today, it was a certain particular time. That I help, Leonardo. Very much, very much for the day. Really, the portal to enjoying our proper Christian blessings. Remember, everything in the sanctuary was gold. It spoke of God's glory. Whereas outside of the tabernacle, and what we call the court of the tabernacle, was brass, or having to do with meeting man's need, but. Uh, uh, as Mr. Hamilton Smith said, that one quote, that in the tabernacle itself, it's what God does for the satisfaction of his own heart. Beautiful, beautiful thought, really. Well, why don't we commend ourselves to the Lord, and then uh, I'll uh, I'll get those uh, uh, spreadsheets to uh, Andrea. Andrea, could you? Uh, is she out of the picture there? Yes. She... Andrea suggested to send it by email to to those who may prefer to receive the. Yes, they they can just uh, let us know, and we will email. Every person that needs by email, but those who want to have it in the phone, that we can also send it in the group. Okay, could you just send me a quick email, Andrea? <laughs> you have my email, don't you? And then I'll just respond to it with the two spreadsheets. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. All right, let's commend ourselves. God, our Father, we thank you for thy precious word. We stand in awe of of not only the person of Christ, the work of Christ, but the eternal counsels and purpose of God. And we uh, know that thou hast taken uh, the uh, materials that had the greatest flaws in them ourselves and has raised us up by thy matchless glory to the highest position of all thy created being. So we pray that this vision would lay a hold of us and we would truly be consecrated to thee, Lord Jesus, and walk in the light of that world of which thou art the center. So we pray these things. Thank thee for the interest of each of these and many others that will perhaps uh, view these things on their uh, more convenient time. We seek for a blessing for thy dear people. We pray these things now, giving thee thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.